Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dennis Watts with Love Gumbers Management Services. I want to welcome you all to our Safety Coordinator Fundamentals, our first session, which is going to be our introduction to Safety Coordinator Fundamentals and more detail um, on inspections and audits. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to be here today. So just a couple of, uh, of things. We've got everybody on mute. So if you have a question during the broadcast, you should be in your little side panel, a little box that says questions. Feel free to ask questions at any time and we'll gather those up and respond either at the end of the session or if it's specific to you individually, we'll respond back to you. If you have a general question that you'd rather respond by email, please feel free to email me and that would be Dennis Watts at dwatts, D-W-A-T-T-S, at lgrms.com, D-W-A-T-T-S, at lgrms.com. So what are we gonna do over the course of these uh, uh, safety coordinator programs we have coming up? Well, our goal is by the end of the three sessions, you're gonna have a greater awareness of the duties and responsibilities of a local government safety coordinator. And from our view, a safety coordinator is the primary person who coordinates all the activities for keeping workers safe and protecting your local government from liability or damage. So you're the, you're the conduit that all that stuff should flow through. We also want you to have a basic foundation for workplace safety and an overview of some of the key safety functions and concepts that might help you uh, perform your duties as a safety coordinator. And then we're going to also give you a template for a basic safety program using the requirements for you to qualify for either the Georgia Municipal Association Safety Grant or the Association County Commission of Georgia Incentive Program. Both of those by doing some basic safety items, basic training, uh, different safety programs can give you some money back or outright grants to purchase items of safety and worker safety equipment. The way we've designed this is we have this broken down to the three one hour sessions. We wanted to keep these short intentionally. So the first session was uh, done earlier this week on Tuesday and the second session for the same topic is today. Session two will either be on September 1st at 10 a.m. or September 3rd at 1 p.m. Session three, September 8th at 10 a.m or September 10th at 1 p.m. So we do one uh, of the same session in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, maybe to help you be able to schedule things a little bit better. So what is workplace safety? What are we gonna cover over the course of these three sessions? Well, the first session we already talked about, introduction to some safety fundamentals and some specifics on audits and self-inspections. Session two will cover accident and incident investigations you know, it's a key to preventing things from happening again and to understand why they happened in the first place. And then we're gonna look at something called job hazard analysis, where we can look at how a specific job is done and identify the hazards that may be associated with that job so we can perhaps prevent worker injury in the performance of that job. And then the last session, we're gonna really focus on local government motor vehicle considerations um, I don't know how many of you realize this, but motor vehicle losses are the number one high dollar losses for local governments in the state of Georgia. And specifically law enforcement is where the highest losses happen. So we'll look at what we need to do um, to minimize those losses and uh, make your entity safe. And we're gonna go over some specifics on the requirements for the ACCG incentive program and the GMA safety grant. Our primary presenter today is our Southwest Georgia loss control uh, consultant, Chris Ryan, and he's gonna introduce himself in just a minute, but I wanted to ask Chris two quick questions before we get started. The sure. first, Chris, what is your, uh, uh, when you're working with a local government safety coordinator from your experience, what are uh, some of the key things you're looking for? What's the value of working with that safety coordinator? Well, definitely the value is putting safety first for your organization. So as a safety coordinator, you got to have the love for your city or county authority that you kind of work for and definitely the employees that work there with you. The last thing you ever want to see is a fellow employee get hurt. 
because of lack of safety or something you haven't done to help safety calls. So we're looking for people that are really going to push that issue with us and provide safety aspects for all types of uh, employees and their job tasks and stuff like that. And they're just an oversight. It's just to kind of help out, not really run everything, but just be that eye on the, eye on the ground kind of person to make sure nobody gets a workers' comp claim by the lack of safety procedures. Thank you for that, Chris. Appreciate it. Since the primary focus of today's topic is on inspections and audits, can you kind of relate from your experience maybe one of the oddest findings or oddest uh, incidents that you saw when you were doing an inspection and audit for one of our members? Well, yeah, uh, there was one instance. I actually just started with the organization, and they said when we inspect, we're supposed to inspect different aspects of the building, and we went into a storage closet area. And I was looking at the lady that was with me, and I looked at the storage area, and I stand about 6'3", and I was barely able to reach the top shelf. And I'm sitting there looking at her, and I'm like, well, can I ask you a question? She goes, sure. I said, well, how do you get the stuff off that top shelf? She goes, hold on a minute. I'll be right back. I'm like, okay. She comes back in a couple of minutes, and she has a rolling chair. And I'm like, no, she's not going to do what I think she's supposed to do. She takes the rolling chair, puts it up against the storage area, and goes to climb on it. And I'm like, wait a minute, what are you doing? She goes, well, it's up against the wall. It's not going to roll. I said, well, you are aware it rolls the other way. And she was like, yeah, I didn't think about that. So it's just having another set of eyes sometimes that, that kind of tell you, wait a minute, this is not the best way to do this. So we actually work with her and the organization to get her a step stool, not only in her storage area, but everywhere else, so they could reach the stuff on the top shelf and not have to climb on chairs and desks and stuff like that. Thank you, Chris, appreciate the story. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Why don't you start off by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, come November 1st, I will be with LGRMS for 13 years. Before that, I was actually five years in with the Sumter County Board of Commissioners. There I was the county clerk, HR director, and of course, safety coordinator, office manager, any other duties therefore assigned. I have a master's degree in business management and a bachelor's in human resources. I also obtained two certifications through the Carl Vincent Institute of Government at the University of Georgia one is the advanced certification in human resource management and i'm also a certified county clerk so i actually see the sides from both i'm seeing it from our side where we're looking at it from the aspect of making sure nobody gets injured the insurance is a uh, point of view but i've seen it from the other side where i was actually the one trying to make sure the employees were safe and what we need to do to provide this safe working atmosphere for them so what we need to do first is talk about what are your responsibilities as a safety coordinator? Now, definitely, we want you to be our contact point. What we're actually working on right now, and hopefully by the time we finish up these sessions, the one, two, and three, we will be calling each of our safety coordinators. The safety coordinator will let us know what type of virtual safety thing we can actually do. Do you have the ability to have cameras on your computers, on your laptops, that we could actually meet with you and go over maybe your lost history and maybe even meet with the other department heads? Or do we really need to do it just by phone and send you like your lost runs and your surveys and updating your department head list and just do it virtually through the phone instead of through the computer itself? But the most things that we're looking forward to is this in-house safety survey. And the reason is that's what we love to do. We love to walk into a city or county and help you out on your safety aspect. Because we've seen things that maybe it hasn't happened to your city or county yet, and we hope it never will. So we're actually bringing our experience to you to kind of show you, well, in the past, this could cause uh, uh, accident to happen. Let's see if we can help out with this one. So the in-house surveys, we'd love to do those. And when we get back out on the road, it's time, it's time for us to go then. 
We also want you to accompany us on the survey. So we're actually showing you what we're looking at, what usually stands out, and believe it or not, we want you to tell us if we've missed something. We know we're human, we're gonna miss stuff and everything. Each one of us has our own little niche that we kind of focus on and stuff like that. But you, since you're there, you can kind of tell us what's going on too. So accompany us on a survey will definitely help you and us out. Now, the different communications that you can use as a safety coordinator to get the information to your employees, we have the monthly safety thing. That's supposed to come out on a monthly basis, and it's just different topics could be seasonal to the point of insects, how do you deal with bites and stuff like that, the cold weather, the hot weather, and you can actually use these monthly safety things to start your safety program. And the way you do that is you actually take these to your different departments, have them go over it with their employees, send it back to you that they've signed it and, and went through the material. And that way, you know, you have a record of that. And that is considered a safety meeting. It could be that simple just to start out if you need to. Now, of course, we have the liability beat. That's only usually for government IRMA members because it is our law enforcement stuff. That's the, the big topics that are hitting law enforcement at the time. Now, we also have a thing called a quarterly risk connection. This is where we usually put best practices, things that catch our eye and stuff like that when we visit city and counties and stuff like that, because we want to give you your props in doing the right thing. So also we have training. Now, this can either come to you through a flyer that we send out when we're getting ready to do regional trainings and everything like that. That's what we're looking forward to, too, getting back out there doing those regional trainings. We also have our website, lgrms.com. You can actually go on that. There's a little icon that says training calendar. You click on that, and anything we have scheduled that's coming up on a regional basis, everything's listed right there. But since we've had to do things a little bit differently, we actually use virtual platforms and we'll send emails out to you to let you know that there's some upcoming training. So you can sign up for that training and make sure you go through that process and it'll actually send you an email back letting you know that you've signed up and this is how you get onto the virtual platform to do the training. Now, this type of training can be for anybody in the organization from department heads, all the way down to the workers. It doesn't matter. Even if you have commissioners or council members that would like to attend, please, the more the merrier. Now, what we usually ask you to do is work with all departments because it's always easy to start out in your own department because you know everybody. But reaching out to those other departments and kind of pulling them in and saying, look, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Can you help us out? Because I can go ahead and tell you, it's going to be difficult to work with departments just because some people don't like change, but if they understand why you're doing this, it's sometimes a little more easier. And definitely you want their input when it comes to different things that you need to do, like training and stuff like that. So what we usually say is we're going to send you a general inspection checklist. This is just very generalized. It kind of tells you stuff like with buildings. Do you have fire extinguishers, yes or no? Have they been serviced on an annual basis? That's through a secondary company. Now, like I said, usually when it comes to your fire departments, they may check them on a monthly basis just to make sure they're in, in checking everything and everything's okay with them, but you should have them serviced on an annual basis by a secondary company. How about this one? If the exit signs are up, are they lit showing how to get out of a building? That's some general things you may see on that. The more uh, specific would be like if you have a fleet shop, what type of lifts do you have when you're working on the vehicles? Or if you have an oil pit, is it covered when you're not using it? Because that is a fall hazard. You want to make sure this doesn't happen to your, to your people. Now, on the more generalized vehicle inspections, you may have stuff like checking lights, checking oil, checking brakes, blinkers, and stuff like that. But on the more specific ones, you may actually have a fire truck that you need to check for your pumps, your gauges, making sure you have that right equipment. And the basic form uh, that you use 
you had these general or site specific and the site specific is more recommended because it tailors and it caters down to what department you're looking at what type of equipment you're looking at that's why it's called site specific to really narrow it down for you so you know what what needs to be changed and stuff so what kind of things do we want you to inspect definitely we want to inspect building safety now that can be anything from the type of stairs you have leading down from different levels of the building how about the number of floors that you have on each building and is there an evacuation on each floor that tells you if in case of emergency how do you get out of the building when we're looking at office safety some things would be like are there any cords lying on the floor that could be trip hazards and we've seen this a couple of times too tears in carpets and you're like well you know the tear has been there forever what could happen there well somebody in a rolling chair if you catch the rolling chair and toss the person out uh somebody with a heel or or a toe of a shoe could catch on it and trip that person also when you think about it filing cabinets can be very detrimental when it comes to shins and knees so if you have this file cabinet open at this location what could happen could it affect someone else so making sure that you close it and stuff like that all right so your fire safety do you have a sprinkler system for your buildings if you do have a sprinkler system has it been serviced or is it not never been serviced and when you really need it it doesn't work so that's important electrical safety could be anything from overloading outlets so maybe do you have any surge protectors that'll help you take some of that ampage off of the the outlet itself are your panel boxes in your different facilities located and also are they labeled and we're saying that when you hit this certain breaker what it turns off and usually what we recommend is there must be a three foot radius around your panel boxes so there's no trip hazards in there and there's an ease to get to your electrical panel boxes so some emergency equipment that you need to check on would definitely be like your fire extinguishers so maybe you'll check them on a monthly basis to make sure that they are, the gauge is still showing that it's in the green because it might have went out for some reason. Maybe it's it's messed up or something. You got to replace it. Or when you use it, you got to make sure that you take it off and replace it with a brand new one. Like I said, you make sure those are labeled and, and serviced on an annual basis to make sure that if you ever need it, it's there and ready to go. Storage methods. What we usually do is like for you to walk around the whole building and we love to look in these little closets and the closets are usually pretty packed because we know storage is very limited when it comes to city, county and authorities. But unfortunately, we're, we're placed in this storage equipment. It's usually where the panel box may be labeled or not be accessible anymore because there's so many boxes in front of it. Or it might be something in there that you need to get to that you can't get to or get out because that's a back door or something like that. You just never know. So some interior stuff would be like dealing with trip hazards, with boxes and stuff like that. Files being um, placed on the ground and cause a slip hazard. When it comes to storage method on your exterior work environments, this is where we usually look at fleets and public works departments because where are they storing stuff like their gas their oil and it's always good that if you have stuff like that that you're storing it in a flammable cabinet also unfortunately we've had a couple of issues once or twice where we found propane tanks inside buildings so that's a big no-no you need to make sure those are outside because if anything ever happened like that it would cause a lot of damage so what should the inspection include? Well, definitely it needs to be in writing. What this does, it actually provides a paper trail, and that's very important if there's ever a liability issue is filed. So you can pull it and prove where the problem was, what we did to resolve it, when it was recorded, and if we called anybody to let them know that it has been complete. So things that it should include, the person and date, and that's the person that's filling out the form, 
and the date that they first looked at it. Any concerns or should be identified from anything that you find where it's located, uh, maybe some pictures or something that you put with it showing that the deficiencies or whatever, any concerns whatsoever. If it's a fire extinguisher that hasn't been serviced in a couple of years, you check it off. And that corrective action shows that you actually went back to that different thing, whether it be a fire extinguisher, whether it be a drop off, whether it be something not stored correctly, and you're making an action that is correcting that issue. And you, all, you always want to make sure you have that corrective action, but you need to date that also to let them know this is when we found out about it, but this is when it was completed. So we're looking at buildings, we're looking at areas outside and stuff. And when you think about it, you know, with winter coming up pretty soon, I know we don't have winters like normally everybody else does, but the time change affects us drastically because sometimes some of the people that are working aren't going home until after it has already gotten dark. And out there in your parking lot, you want to make sure that you have proper lighting so they can get to their car and there's a safety aspect behind that. So stuff like that is what we need to look for and what we need to inspect and have your, your concerns identified and have those corrective actions as soon as possible. And we do understand sometimes corrective actions may take a little bit longer to do, but please make sure they're done. So follow up and correct. This is what usually happens what you need to do is when you have this action that you found to be deficient, you send the recommendation from either you or your safety committee. And your safety committee, some cities and counties are not able to have safety committees because they're a little bit smaller than everyone else. But if you're able to have a safety committee, this is the group that'll help you send the recommendations and stuff like that. That's kind of what we do. When we come into a city or county or authority, we look around and the first thing we do if we start writing recommendations and that's not made to make you feel inferior or feel like you've done something wrong. It's just things that we are suggesting that you do to make it a more safe working environment for your people. So we provide the date that we saw it and for the department to respond, we want them to get back with us and let, it, let, let us know exactly how long do they think it's going to take to get it done. And that's what we usually ask of our safety coordinators, because when we send these recommendations to you, you have about a 90 day window that you're supposed to respond to these recommendations. And it's not saying that you're going to do the recommendations right then and there, but you're giving us a plan of action on what you're going to be doing. That's what you're looking for from the departments. So then you may actually have to go back periodically and make sure that it hasn't been if it's not been completed. How long is it going to take to get it completed? You know, sometimes things happen and we forget to do stuff. And it's just you're the person that's going to come back and go, OK, wait a minute. Remember, we had this right here. Can we go ahead and correct it? And that's what we do when we come back for another visit. We may actually set you up a visit six months down the line, a year down the line or whatever that we think we should do according to the type of recommendation we give you. And that's what you need to look at, too. How? important is that recommendation fire extinguisher pretty important okay hole in the floor that could cause a fall hazard pretty important you need to get stuff corrected so you want to make sure those are done in an adequate time span so what type of areas do we need to look at we definitely want to look at our employees because they're the most important part of our city county or authority that is the knowledge and the skills and stuff. And like I said, most of the time, you know all of your employees and that's the last person you want to have develop a worker's comp claim due to a lack of safety. We want to look at vehicles and equipment. So what type of vehicles are we using? What type of equipment are we using? Are we using them correctly? And definitely we want to focus on some job procedures. And the best way to look at a job procedure is the person that's doing the job or has done the job, they develop these job procedures. That way they're telling you what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and you're not telling them because maybe you've never done the job before. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit too. So looking at our employees. So if you look at this picture, 
he's standing on a ladder that's probably not adequate for what he's doing. Now, if you look to the left, that stack was a little bit lower, and that ladder was definitely efficient for what he was doing then or she was doing then. But when you come over to this next side and you see how are they doing this job, they're not doing it very well because if you remember, anytime you're working with a ladder, that step right before you get to the top says, do not proceed above this step, could be hazardous. So definitely they are risking some injury if they're not using that equipment the right way. And that's what the next one is. Is it the right equipment? At this point right now, this is not the right equipment. So maybe you need to get or ask for a taller ladder. And then everybody says, well, we don't have any money and stuff like that. And we always look at it like this. You're either going to pay now or later. So if you get the right equipment now, you don't have to worry about what could possibly happen later. Training is essential no matter what you're doing. And everybody's like, oh, everybody knows how to put up a ladder. You would be surprised some of the stuff we've actually seen. We actually had one person that had a fold up ladder just like this. It was not open, leaning up against the wall, trying to climb on it. What you want to make sure is they open it up correctly and lock it out. Make sure the grooves on the bottom, the grips are working. There's no loose runs or anything. There's a lot of stuff you can do and you can use the equipment that you have to make sure you have the right equipment. So we're looking at policies and procedures. And unfortunately, when it comes to this, it's usually more on the disciplinary side of it that if they're not doing things the bright way or the proper way, then they might have to be disciplined. But anytime you buy a piece of equipment that comes with procedures on how to properly do use the piece of equipment, also, if you bought the equipment from someone else, maybe have them come in and train your employees on the proper procedure of using that equipment. I'll go ahead and tell you, our employees love shortcuts because they have to get this done. They have something else that's pending. And sometimes the shortcuts are very, very ingenious, okay? We love, as field reps, to ride around between the months of November and December. Thanksgiving to Christmas, and we like to watch how cities and counties put up Christmas lights. Usually some interesting stories. We'll have to tell you about some of those when we come out doing our inspections. So is this person using the equipment right? Is it the right equipment? Are they doing it great? Or are they having to be creative to get the job done because they were told just to do it? And like I said, this is where we come in and go, this is not the right piece of equipment. This is where you come in and say, look, we need to change this equipment. What else do you need to make it more efficient? So next, we're going to look at our vehicles. And the best thing to use when you're doing an inspection of a vehicle is your owner's manual. This will tell you what the lights on the dashboard actually mean. And orange means warning, red means it's about to go out, okay? I'll just go ahead and give you that little extra bit of information. It also tells you the proper maintenance and when it should be done according to the mileage on the vehicle. So owner's manual is probably the first thing you should look at when you get a new piece of equipment and you want to do some training on it. Also, one thing you need to make sure it has, whether it be vehicles or equipment, you got to make sure it has seat belts. Seat belts are very important. They, those will hold you in if anything bad happens and keep you in the cab and not allow you to be thrown out and stuff like that. So we want to make sure the first thing you look for is a seat belt policy. This seat belt policy covers you, a coworker, or anybody that gets in that vehicle with you, you must buckle up before that vehicle moves. And if it, they don't buckle up, you can't move it. So seat belts are important. So if this vehicle doesn't have a seat belt, it might not need to be used. Now I'll go ahead and tell you, when it comes to equipment, sometimes we have bought equipment in the past or it's actually disappeared. Seat belts are not there. We're not telling you to retrofit this piece of equipment, but anything bought further, please make sure it has a seat belt and use that on a limited basis, the one that doesn't have the seat belt. 
you want to make sure the lights are working. So not only the blinkers, the headlights, the tail lights, but any lights that are on this vehicle. And a good example is a sanitation vehicle because when they're going down the road, all these lights are flashing to let people know that they're stopping or moving that piece of equipment to pick up trash. And if these things are out, what could happen? Somebody could actually pull up too far behind them. They not see that this person's behind them and they go to back up and they could cause some damage to the other person's vehicle. So you want to make sure all your lights are working and stuff. On our vehicles also, you want to make sure the tires are in good condition. So when you look at the tire, it does not need to be slick because that decreases your tread. Your tread is what actually keeps the car in control. It allows you to have that traction on the road. And it also repels the water from getting into the tire and stuff so it actually provides you with a with a smooth um, area to ride on so your sidewalls are usually the things that tell you what type of tire that you actually have what's the inflation rate what size it is and stuff like that so you want to make sure that you're using the proper tire for the proper vehicle and especially when it comes to big heavy equipment or emergency vehicles you want to make sure that these things are the right things on the vehicle. The inflation of a tire is very important because it could cause you to lose control also. It could cause the tire to pop if it's not inflated correctly or overinflated. So you wanna check that and it's always good if you have this, you have a fleet maintenance person that's checking these tires, especially on your emergency vehicles to make sure they have proper tires and they're in good condition so it's not going to be a hazard once we get it out on the road. So next thing you want to look at is, is your glass in good condition on these vehicles? Is the windows on the side gone so if anything comes flying through the window, it could hurt or injure your employee? Do you have a crack on the front windshield? And unfortunately, that happens a lot just because rocks and stuff come up and hit the glass and the last thing you want to do is have that glass shattered or it starts spreading on the crack because you didn't fix it when it first happened. So it's always good to replace your glass as soon as possible to make sure you have a safe work environment in the cab. And of course, proper signage on the vehicle. We're looking for that. And that could be anything from that reflective tape that if it's kind of dark or the fact that it's orange and it kind of reflects a little bit, so when somebody comes up behind you, you can see it. And unfortunately, as you know, when it comes to a lot of our big heavy equipment, things kind of fall off of the equipment sometimes. And it causes hazards in the road from maybe rocks or, or dirt clogs or something like that. So you want that sign that says, stay back so many feet. So maybe it'll give it time to settle on the ground before that car comes by. So you're always looking for that proper signage. And if you don't have some signs on the back of your vehicles like this, you probably need to get them, some warning signs. Next thing we're gonna talk about is equipment. So are our employees using this equipment properly? Let's look at the picture. I would probably say, no, they're not using it correctly. And if you ever see this, please, make them stop doing this because what they were told was you need to get that tank up to the catwalk and this person goes hmm how do we do that we don't have anything that'll take it up that high wait a minute i've got an idea and that's usually where it starts going wrong because how much weight should those teeth have on it from that front end loader or that fort lift and these people standing on the other fort lift or front end loader when it's on top of something else and they're using it to put the, the tank on top. And if I'm looking at this correctly, I look at C seven to eight people that could possibly be injured if this doesn't go right. So is this right for the job? Definitely not. You may actually have to get another piece of equipment in there to actually take this tank and put it up there properly so what standard should be used please do not use this standard this is definitely the wrong standard 
So you want to make sure that you have everything you need before starting the job. So the standard needs to be work done as safely and effectively as you can to get the job done, but make sure you have the right equipment, like I always said. So next thing we're gonna talk about is job procedures. Have you ever come to a job and the first thing they say is, here you go, here's the keys, go forth and conquer. Well, unfortunately, we're notorious for that when it comes to cities and counties because training is not really on our minds. We've got a job to do, we've got to get it done. But the most important thing is training. So have you been trained on how to do the job? And the job procedures actually will tell you the do's and don'ts of what to do. And like I said, the best person to actually do this is the person doing the job. They know what they're supposed to do, not supposed to do. And if they're gone one day or a week or a month or something like that, somebody coming in and doing their job while they're gone will have some protocol on how to get it done. And don't assume just because they've told you in the past I know how to work this piece of equipment. Don't assume they know that what they're doing. You want them to show you that they know how to work this piece of equipment. So maybe you even put them on this front end loader or this fort lift and say, okay, go do this, go pick up this, go get a bucket of this and bring it back to me or something like that. So you wanna make sure they're doing the job correctly. And then you may have to go back periodically Maybe when they're out working on the road or something like that, or working in at a building or something like that, moving stuff, you actually go back and make sure that they're doing it and they're not taking any shortcuts that they've learned while on the job that could cause hazards to happen in the future. So maybe some retraining may have to happen, but these job procedures will actually take you step by step what you need to do and how you need to do it. So when we're looking at self-inspection, we wanna focus on prevention. We wanna make sure if we see this happening, what could happen and how do we prevent it from ever happening again? So you're looking at this picture, there's a guy on a ladder, looks like maybe he's changing a ballast on a light. Looks like he's doing everything with a ladder correctly. He's not on the top rung, he's got it locked out. But if you look to the right, there's an opening where the ladder is standing. Now, what type of building is that? I mean, does anything come in that building? Could an employee walk in there and hit the ladder by accident, not knowing this person is working on the light? So you wanna make sure that you use that team concept to have someone put some barricades outside saying, work going on in this facility, please be careful, or have somebody out there stopping people from walking in this open door that could cause somebody to fall especially if he drops something or that panel that's swinging down from the light doesn't disconnect from the side and fall on them. So you want to make sure that when you're doing this, you're following up and correcting any problems. So if it's happened in the past, it could happen in the future. So you always want to make sure that you're doing everything the right way. And the most important thing that I can tell you to do when it comes to inspections is document everything from when it started to when it was complete and when you finished. The more documentation you have on a self-inspection, the better off it's gonna be if a liability case ever pops up. And that's the last thing you wanna think about, but you wanna make sure also that your employee isn't injured on the job. So who's out there to help you? Well, we definitely have the two pools, insurance pools that are for the members, ACCG and GMA. Now we have us, LGRMS. We are a group of about 14 individuals. There is um, four field reps that usually do the whole state of Georgia when it, we are considered risk consultants that we come in to cities and counties. Right now we have three working on four, but we come in and do these evaluations for you. Uh, the organization was founded in 89. It was the organization that was actually put together by ACCG and GMA. So please, if you ever need anything, call your field rep. You can actually go onto our website, lgrms.com, and go to staff, and anybody in there can help you out. But if you want to look at where 
your field rep and who your field rep is, it actually has a map that shows you who we are and you can contact us for sample policies or anything like that. And we can actually show you how to get onto our website that actually has stuff like extra sample policies, webinars that you can actually use if you're maybe it's raining outside and the public works director says we can't go out what else can we do besides cleaning up and stuff like that here's an, here's another training aspect that you can use for your employees anything we have on our website is yours for the taking please use it as much as you can and of course we usually also direct you to we have two other um, training platforms that we're trying to get started. Local Government U is actually on our website and everything. We want to make sure you have the proper training that you need when you need it for your employees. And remember this too, you have some very talented people that work with you. So what we want you to do is use these talented people. You may actually have to ask, or in the past you've noticed that this person knows how to operate this piece of equipment very effectively and efficiently and hadn't had any problems, that's the person you want to train these new employees coming in to show them the proper way of doing stuff so they don't get these shortcuts and stuff stuck in their heads. So now we're at the point, uh, does anyone have any questions they, for me? Chris, um, this is Dennis. I have uh, two questions for you. One is when you're getting ready to inspect or do some audits of your department or your whole local government, should you do it as a safety coordinator or could you get other people from maybe the department you're going to look at to, to assist you? Well, there's, there's many things that you can do right here. You can do them on your own if you would like to, because maybe you, you just, that's just your demeanor. You want to make sure that you're the one doing it. You're finding any any hazard or whatever, stuff like that. But it's okay to actually ask your department heads to do it also and get back with you on the problems that they are finding. Now, we talked about safety committees. Uh, safety committees are definitely helpful when it comes to this, just because that's another group that can do these evaluations. And that way, the department director doesn't have to take time out of their busy schedule to do them or you don't, you've got a committee that can actually help you out with this. And they actually may see stuff that maybe somebody that works in that department and is used to seeing, they may see a hazard there that they don't, that the employee at that department doesn't see. Very good, thank you, Chris. All right, what's the second question? How big should you be um, if you're going to have a safety committee? Well, there's actually, there's actually not a set thing when it comes to a safety committee because you may have an organization, a city or county or authority that has three people working there because you're a small location. All three people can be on the safety committee. But what we usually recommend when it comes to a safety committee is that every department that you have, you have somebody represented on the safety committee from that department. That way, not only do they understand what's going on, what we're trying to accomplish, but they can take information back to that department and tell them what's going on, what we're looking at, what we're seeing. And actually that department can come up with a plan and they can bring it back to the safety committee as a group instead of worrying about, oh my goodness, well, we gotta go talk to these people in this department and these people in this department. You've got somebody bringing back those plan of actions already for you. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So um, just wanted to remind everybody that uh, this safety coordinator fundamental series will be given over uh, three one hour sessions. Uh, you just completed the first session session two which will talk about accident investigations and job hazard analysis will be on september 1st from 10 to 11 and then on september 3rd from 1 to 2 session three which will talk mostly about local uh government motor vehicles will be on september 8th from 10 to 11 and september 10th from 1 to 2. as part of the uh, uh program, you will be getting some handouts. We'll be giving you a recording of the 
uh, webinar user experience. You'll also be getting a couple of handouts. You'll be getting both a PDF and a Word copy of both our self-inspection form, facility self-inspection form, and our motor vehicle inspection form. You'll get the Word document so you can kind of modify that um, for some specific things that you might want to do. They're very general in nature. We'll also give you a uh, reference workbook that we use in our uh, that we normally use in our person-to-person uh, -person safety coordinator training, and we'll give you also a PDF copy of our LGRMS brochure. You should be getting that, um, you know, certainly by the end of the three sessions. Uh, if we can uh, do it, we'll give those to you as you complete each of these. Now, again, to get credit for the fundamentals of safety coordinator, you must attend all three sessions um, and to, to get that credit. At any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, you can email me at uh, dwatts, D-W-A-T-T-S, at lgrms.com, or feel free to email Chris, Chris Ryan, C Ryan, C-R-Y-A-N, at lgrms.com. Hey, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to participate with us today. Again, we wanted to keep these short and sweet, so everybody be safe out there. Take care and we'll uh, we'll see some of you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.